so I appreciate you spending time and weathering the weather to come have this talk. Um, and I also just want to thank Dr. Christine Boston for continuing to be a liaison in the collaboration between the university and the library, and many thanks to the library for helping facilitate these kinds of conversations because, as she noted, the topic tonight, I think, is very much a timely one, and it's one that merits a lot of discussion and consideration, and uh, I, I'm glad that here in the middle of Missouri, in the capital city, in a state that is um, widely quite politically conservative and very much against ideologically some of the themes that I will be talking about tonight, um, I appreciate them doing the labor of having these kinds of talks, and sometimes those discussions can be difficult, but oftentimes the most difficult discussions are also the most important ones that we need to be having. So my talk tonight is called Gender in and Through Language on Performance, Identity, and Communication. My name, for those who don't know me, is uh, Dr. Mick Brewer, and I am an assistant professor of communication studies at Lincoln University here in Jefferson City. And broadly, my research and my teaching uh, exists at the intersections of interpersonal communication and relational sense making, as well as intercultural context. And that spans, oh, dear Lord, that spans lots of, get here, ignore all of everything you just saw. It's like opening a Christmas present too early. Um, and so broadly my work looks at gender and relating in a number of different contexts, um, including educational context, same-sex friendships. I look at gender and sexuality a lot across different relational contexts. And so tonight my hope is to work through and talk about this idea of gender as being a communicative sort of phenomenon. And what struck me to do this particular talk was I was approached about the possibility of a discussion on pronouns, was how it was presented to me. There's a lot of confusion and hostility surrounding the idea of pronouns right now. Particularly the they them <coughs> pronoun has seemed to stimulate a lot of derision as well as confusion amongst people. So I wanted to sort of approach gender from a communication perspective that will eventually hopefully lead us to a discussion of pronouns and the like. The first thing I would like to do is go over the agenda a little bit. So. Uh, the first thing I'm going to touch on momentarily are some basic distinctions between sex and gender. And then I want to follow that with looking at the gendered landscape, as we might think of it as. So thinking about um, gender not just as a socially constructed phenomenon, but as something that is incredibly powerful and pervasive in terms of it being a very strong organizing variable or principle in our social and cultural lives. And then I will get into a discussion on some philosophy of language and then segue that into gender as a language or linguistic phenomenon as well as a performative phenomenon. And then we're gonna round out tonight's talk with a interview, we might think of it as, a, a conversation or a dialogue, I think is a productive way of thinking about it, between myself and Ari Starks, who is sitting up front right here, and Ari is a uh, student at Lincoln University who is an open trans man and I think it's very important not only to have these discussions in a theoretical sense but also to have a practical dialogue and to humanize this subject matter because one of the problems that has happened as we continue to create discourse surrounding gender and gender identity is the removing of an ethos from those discussions to reduce body people to bodies and to reproductive parts and to position particular kinds of bodies and subjectivities um, not so much as human individuals but as politicized or political discourse and what a privilege it is I would imagine to have your existence be something that is not seen um, as a political side of ideological warfare, but just seen as neutral, natural, normal, or necessary. So to kick us off, I just want to talk a little bit, very briefly, about distinctions between gender and sex. This seems to be kind of the point of contact that elicits confusion on any discussion that we have about gender itself. So 
When we talk about sex, we're talking about the biological body as something produced in and through and by nature, right? Gender, on the other hand, is the sort of socialized application of or application to that sex body. And by that we mean thinking about when one comes out of the womb, you're in effect this blank slate, right? You are a blank slate, if you will. You come out and you come out as a biological species. Everything that happens after that, all of the meaning making that we create, all of the associations that we, we create between men and certain objects or behaviors, performances, women or fem, femininity between certain objects, behaviors, performative, is totally socially constructed. And we'll get into what that means in a little bit. Um, so when we think about the difference between the sex body and the gender body, again, so much we think about the sex body, we reduce it to genitalia. And it's really important to think about the importance of that, of using genitalia as such a profound organizing variable in our existence. Because not to get too much into the logistics and technicalities of the biological body, there are many similarities between the male and female biological bodies, right? And the fact that we institute and institutionalize such differences between the sex body, between men and women, as a biological reproductive phenomenon is quite telling. And so much of our understanding of gender, the social construction that we assign to those bodies, is also deeply rooted in this binary way of thinking. So I want to start there. So if gender is something that we socially construct, it is tethered to, in some ways, the sex body, that it's the meanings that we sort of all contribute to designating as having an association with those. So where does this come from, though? Where does it manifest? If we see this idea that we have created gender distinctions in our social, cultural, relational lives, where do we see these differences pop up? And the interesting thing about gender is that it's very much like air or water in the sense that we are kind of constantly flirting with or relying on it, even if we don't know that, or even if we're not thinking about those terms through a gender lens. So I want to first talk about how we rank gender, and all, or some of rather, the places that we see gender as a phenomenon manifest and illustrating just how much we emphasize gender division. So it's not so much enough that we construct these masculine, feminine, or male and female genders. It's also that we create a stratified order and rank these genders. And I don't think that I have to tell too many people in here um, about which gender, if we're going to follow Western binarial thinking, and think of things only in either or black and white terms, I don't think I have to do much work tonight telling you which gender we prefer, socially, culturally. I think most people in here have some form of awareness of gender privilege, whether or not you're the person who inherits that privilege or you're the person who is disenfranchised out of that privilege. <coughs> this is what we call gender ranking. So how it is that we have decided which gender, in effect, is better, more valuable, and has more merit in our social lives. I'm going to go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. The big surprise, in case anybody was wondering, traditionally, historically, globally, we have prioritized men and masculinity. I don't know if that's news to anyone in here. I don't think it probably is, but it is very much a real thing. And this is what we call androcentrism the valuing and prioritization of men and masculinity, or things that we associate with men and masculinity, okay? And so what this does is it translates into a cultural system that privileges any sort of thing that we might attribute to or see as connected to men and masculinity. So in societies that value masculinity, it's interesting that we give certain opportunities, and I'll use the term give um, in a sort of liberal way here, we give women the opportunity to take on some of these codes of men and masculinity. And we designate that as being okay. So for example, we have the, the phrase tomboy, right? Now the, the phrase tomboy ha, is 
was originated in the 20th century, and it is a term that simply describes a little girl who has interest in little boy things, right? We might think of it as playing with cars and trucks, or climbing trees, or having an interest in hunting and fishing or sports, these things that we associate, that we've created to be associated with men. Now, it's also interesting, though, that if we think back to when we're little, and this idea of transgressing gender, because that's what a tomboy has always been about, if not in those terms, but in practice. That is what being a tomboy really is. It is a little girl transgressing gendered expectations of her. That if we think about the ways that we respond to little boys, for example, who do the same trait, it's just the inversion, where little boys have an interest in things that we associate with little girls. If you recall, we don't extend the same kind of leniency or acceptance to those little boys, right? So instead of the term tomboy, you might get things like sissy or pansy or queer, if not worse, sort of catapulted towards you. And what this does is it tells us a few things. One, it tells us that there is a very clear distinction between what boys and girls should do and that we so passionately believe that and adhere to that script that we in fact have names for those who don't conform to those expectations as though there's some sort of magical unicorn, that their presence or interest in those things is so rare that it elicits its own linguistic title. So that's interesting. But it also tells us about the values that we associate with each gender. Why is it that we're so comfortable with little girls becoming more like boys, but we are so reticent and resistant about little girls becoming, or like little boys becoming more like little girls. What does that tell us about our attitudes or beliefs about little girls if we're so offended by the prospect of a little boy taking interest in those things, right? So there's where we can see this kind of androcentric ideology pop up from the get-go. And we don't do this for boys, this idea of allowing or extending those kind of traits, right? We don't do that. Another thing about androcentrism, this idea of valuing men and masculinity, is that it shapes our cultural norms, our ethics, our values, our morals, our ways of thinking and seeing and doing and being and knowing. And so characteristics that we might typically associate with masculinity, control, strength, competitiveness, toughness, coolness under pressure, logic, forcefulness, decisiveness, rationality, autonomy or independence, self-sufficiency, control over emotions, and the ability to compartmentalize. These are attributes that we oftentimes code as meaningful within various contexts, athletic contexts, business contexts. And once again, we see kind of the alternative or the foil to each of these being dismissed socially, right? So where does this come from? Where do we see this happening, this androcentric set of attitudes? I wanted to pinpoint this kind of offer a cursory quick view, if you will, in some of the domains where we see this pop up. One is in media, and we could spend the next five years having this weekly discussion at the same time and place covering the ways in which media functions as a very powerful plane where gender is constructed and represented. But I wanted to just show a few statistics here to have you all think about the significance of androcentrism, particularly within media. So we know that, for example, within children's programming, girls out, uh, represent, or boys out represent girls three to one in terms of the stories that we are willing to tell and share and create for our young children. Most films that win Best Picture over the past almost 100 years in the Oscars have overwhelmingly focused on male stories, male narratives. Subsequently, only three women have won the Oscar for Best Director in almost 100 years. I want to let that number sort of settle with you for a minute that in 100 years almost, I think next year will be the 92nd or third Oscars, three women have been elected or nominated, won this particular award. Athletics, do we have any athletic fans in here? Any athletes, former athletes, some? I hate athletics, but yeah. <laughs> they're not my thing. They've never been my thing. That's probably because when I was a little boy, I was a sissy. So I was not so interested in things like athleticism. But I know many people are fans of this world. And we will also see this androcentric ideology manifest here. Some points. The average salary for an NBA player, a male NBA player, is $4.5 million. 
the woman's version of this, the WNBA, her average salary is a whopping $72,000. Again, compared to four and a half million. That is 1.6 of his total. I don't know about her, I would probably just be a professor. It's certainly a lot less physical labor. <laughs> <laughs> the Professional Golf Association salary average is 973,000 versus LPGA is 162,000. Men's tennis, you see a little bit more of an interesting thing happen here. Women on average do go higher in average salary for tennis. But if you look at the top earners from each respective gender category, you will see that the top male earners make 7.2 million, while women make 3.8 million. So again, not quite, but almost double. Electoral politics. This one's probably a sensitive subject given, well, I don't know, the last five years, seven years. Um, I feel like we're in this weird time warp right now. I don't know exactly, but um, some stats on this. 15% uh, of the world's lawmakers were women in 2003, and by 2016, that number had increased to 23%. So that's a decent job, sure, but I want you to think for a minute that that means that 77% of the world's lawmakers and the laws that are being conducted and created through those uh, lawmakers are coming through the lens and the position and the eyes of men. And not only just laws, but laws specifically about women. In 2017, women occupied only 19.4% 19 of Congress and ran at 25% of state legislators in the U.S. Roughly 10% of women are governors. Again, to put that into perspective, that's 90% men. In 1997, we were ranked, the U.S. was ranked as 52 on the international list of women's representation in politics. In 2016, we were at number 97. And within a college context, we know that women often participate in student government. But again, when we look at the more finer details, we'll see that women, even though are participatory in student government, in leadership positions where the real power and authority resides, we see a significantly smaller amount of women in those positions. It is, of course, worth noting that we are in 2022, um, and we still have never had a woman president. So just something to note there. And I want to piggyback and circle around to what I just talked about with some of the androcentric attitudes about valuing men and things associated with masculinity. And let's put that into a political context for a moment. Back in 2008, when Hillary Clinton, bless her heart, was running for the first time for president, was having a conversation with my stepmom about it at the time. I went and saw Hillary speak live near my hometown in Asheville, North Carolina, and my stepmom was sort of mortified that I did this. And she said, I would never vote for her for president. I would never vote for a woman for president. And I remember she said it explicitly like that. And I said, why? And she said, well, what if she got her period? <laughs> and you probably know where I'm going with what if she got her period and then had some sort of mood swing and then hit the nuke button? So associating women with hysteria, a lack of control, not being able to compartmentalize emotions, and weaponizing her own biological functions against her. And this was coming from the mind of another woman. So this tells you just how profoundly deep this ideology runs, right? to be conditioned to such an extent to believe in your own inferiority. And that's quite heartbreaking, is it not? Um, there's a delicious irony, of course, in that she was afraid of an emotionally unstable, chaotic, violent outburst because of a period when we received a president who had many <laughs> chaotic outbursts um, and acts of aggression that had at least nothing to do, at least rhetorically, that was charged with associating with his gender, right? So just something to think about. And then religion. Religion is oftentimes the sort of ground zero, we might think of it as, for gender dynamics and the expectations of gender. And even though we do in our constitution have the declaration that we will have separation of church and state, 
um, religious ideology does very much permeate our laws, right? And so just to give, a, again, a cursory look at the state of gender in theology, uh, most religions do uh, base their foundation on masculine God language and this sort of masculine iconography, right? Um, we center male prophets, we give male figures in the Bible uh, the authority to make rules for both men and women. We also use masculine God language, the generic hymn, our Heavenly Father, even the term kingdom, for example, implies a physical geographic state-run area that is ruled by a man. A couple of fun Bible scriptures I would just throw out um, to kind of indicate where some of this ideology originates. I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. That's from Corinthians, from 10. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And so because of that ideology, women are oftentimes excluded in religious practices and rituals, and there is a striking dearth of female priests, bishops, and preachers across all denominational lines. I'm always really fascinated by how defensive people get over the even remote suggestion of what if God were a woman? <laughs> Ariana Grande. Anybody in here familiar with Ariana Grande? Now, a few years ago, she came out with a song called God is a Woman, and the amount of pushback that she received, death threats, again, irony there, because she had this song that used the metaphor of God to suggest that she were a woman. And this idea, even just a suggestion that this being that we can't see because it is faith and not fact, correct? Even the remote suggestion that this mythical figure that exists somewhere could be a woman and have traits associated with womanness and femininity was so outrageous. And that's very telling about kind of our attitudes about women. There's not a lot of difference between that response and people getting in a tizzy, to use academic language, <laughs> about a little boy wanting to play with dolls, right? So where does this come from? Where do we learn these things? This is what we call gender socialization. Where are we socialized into gender? If gender, again, is this socially constructed set of rules or scripts that we have assigned to the sex body, where do they come from? As with many things, a good place to look starts in the home. The home, the family life, is a very important site of world making because families and the homes that they are in are not existent in a vacuum. They are not insulated from the rest of the world. Families are both products of and contributors to larger systemic ideological norms. And if we look at a lot of the behaviors and patterns of parents and children, we can see where lots of this devaluing of certain genders and praise for others originates and continues, but we can also see, once again, that strict division between men and between women. So, Bureau of Labor Statistics finds that among 25 to 34 year olds, women do 31.7 hours of housework on average compared to men's 15.8. And a post-feminist lens, so post-feminism being a framework for conceptualizing the women's movement of the 1960s and 70s, as somehow in the past now, that the feminist work and activism of women before us, our hands are sort of done, everything's good. We had this moment, we had this movement, and now things are fine. And a post-feminist sensibility will lend itself for us thinking that everything's fixed now. We live in a world in which there is true equity among heterosexual unions, and reunions too, maybe, I don't know. <coughs> but this is almost double, and that is still a lot. That should be troubling, I think. So what does this mean for kids? We learn from our parents, so do we replicate the behaviors that we are seeing our parents do? We know that 67% of boys get paid an allowance to do chores versus 59% of girls. Boys regularly do outdoor chores, while girls typically do chores that are sequestered to the inside. So we're seeing kind of, again, that reliance on that nature-nurture narrative and that hunter-gatherer narrative, right? Girls spend more time doing housework than playing, statistically, while boys spend about 30% less time doing household chores and twice as much playing. 
We also know that girls have earlier curfews than boys, signifying once again that women's bodies are something to be controlled, to be surveyed, to be pol policed. It's the same kind of de rhetoric and discourse that happens when you see a t-shirt out in a store and dads love wearing these t-shirts that says something like, you know, come near my daughter, there's like three dots, and then there's a rifle. <laughs> right? This idea of daughters somehow being infantilized and worthy of protection and not having their own strength. We also need to think about the, to the toys and hobbies that we script for our children. Think about the kinds of behaviors and the skills and the values that are learned from what we teach our children. So we typically teach boys, we socialize boys into doing things like playing sports. We encourage sports because we think physical ability equates to masculine sensibility or masculine value. We think about hunter, hunting, gathering, cops, robbers, cars, trucks, video games. All kind of things that are very skills-based that are oftentimes competitive-based, right? Whereas girls' hobbies and toys, it's usually things like dolls, playing house, Barbie, where the girl is conditioned to focus on appearance and nurturing. That it's not about competitiveness, it's about collaboration. And if not collaboration, then you functioning as a support role for the baby doll, for the little house that you're playing. And the ways that we teach little boys and little girls is so profoundly different that scholars in fact call this two culture theory. That it's as though we are raising little boys in a totally different world than girls and vice versa. So that tells us, it reinforces this idea again, that not only is gender a thing, but there's only two, and that we try to fit these very neat categories of behavior and interest into those two distinct categories. But what if I were to tell you that's all a myth, that it's fake, or to use the word I like to use in my class sometimes, bullshit. <laughs> I want to get into a little bit of philosophy of language because I want us to think tonight about gender as a communicative phenomenon as well as a bit of a performance, which can kind of work to combat and destabilize a lot of the norms and statistics that I just gave. So when we think about language, ah, there we go, it's very important in our social world and I approach language broadly and more specifically communication as a constitutive force. And what that means to treat communication as a constitutive force is to mean that communication is not a tool for describing the world as we oftentimes think of it, but language and communication is a tool for creating our social worlds. And that is a very big distinction to make. Typically when we think about language, we think about it as a tool that we have, as though it's always existed, and it's used to describe phenomena that we see or do. To say that it's constitutive is to say that, no, our language doesn't act as a point of reference for other things, but it creates the thing itself. So as an example, we've got, I don't know, 35 people in here, 30 people. If we were to set in here together, just like this, for the next, I don't know, five months, and we didn't utter a single word to one another. Obviously in that time, we would pick up on one another's nonverbal idiosyncrasies. We would get a vibe for each other, to use the language of the youths. We could do vibe checks, right? And get a feel for some sense of each other. But at the end of that time period, because none of us are, to my knowledge, um, are hearing impaired, and maybe most of us are not versed in sign language, our ability to communicate, if I made the rule, we are not talking, would be limited. What that means is that by the end of this five month case study experiment, relationally speaking, we would probably be not much more advanced or progressed than we are in this very moment. Now what that tells us then is that the language and communication that we use is vital to the worlds we create. I teach interpersonal communication. I always tell students that interactions are a bit like building blocks or bricks of a house. Each interaction that you have is another brick as you're building that structure. Language is important, but language is also a very power-laden phenomenon, meaning that it's not objective, it's not unbiased, even though we might think about it as such. 
it's an important part of the social world and understanding the role that language plays in it and in communicating and manipulating and controlling is vital to understanding our notions of power. Much of language has been created from an individualistic perspective, meaning that language and concepts brought to bear in terms have been organized and orchestrated through an individual perspective that doesn't account for the experiences of other people. And again, just to kind of reiterate this notion of language and communication as constitutive, it sees language as almost a he and the locksmith at the same time. Take a term or a concept that might be quite ubiquitous to us now. Something like, in my class last week, I used the example of anxiety, for example. When I say, I'm feeling anxious, everyone in here would have some idea of what that means. Even if we have subjective experiences with, or maybe no experiences at all, if you're lucky with anxiety, you have a general understanding, and therefore you can do things like empathize, console, listen, build rapport. That's because the concept of, whether we're talking in a denotative definition or connotative definition, is quite ubiquitous now, but that has not always been the case. If we were to time travel back 200 years and you said to some farmhand, I'm feeling anxious today, it's likely that they really wouldn't know what you were saying. So how is it that through the development of not only this term, but the associations that we have with it, it enables us to better understand the human condition, the human experience, and advance because of it, right? So that is what we mean by language or communication as constitutive. So what does this mean in a gender context? What is language's relationship to gender? There's a couple of frameworks that are really useful for thinking about that intersection between gender and language. One is muted group theory, the other is what we call hermeneutic or hermeneutical injustice. The ways in which language functions as a weak gatekeeping enterprise to not only establish rules and regulations, but potentially to keep people out of society. So the marginalized are prevented from creating concepts, terms, and other representational resources that could be used in order to conceptualize and understand their own experiences. And thinking back to this idea that the people who are gatekeepers of language, who are the gatekeepers of language? Who gets to have the authority to architect and be the author of the way that we see the world, the way that we understand the world? Thinking about the androcentric nature of our world for centuries, reason and logic tells us then that much of the language that we have to craft our view of the world comes through the perspective of men. So people in positions of power, whether that be people who are Caucasian, people who are white, people who are male, people who are heterosexual, tend to create concepts and linguistic representations that help conceptualize their experiences, those that are relevant to them, rather than the experiences of other people, than the marginalized. So what does this look like? Muted group theory quite simply says that marginalized communities, and this originated looking at women and women's speech, how women are kept out of language. And so there's sort of three primary tenets to this. One is that the masculine power to name experience. Who gets the power to name experience? Who gets a power to have a platform to vocalize that experience? If 78% of lawmakers in the world are men, that's 23% of a woman's experience getting into the discourse there on lawmaking, right? Which is a very small fraction. So the power to name experience. Being gatekeepers of communication. When we think about gatekeeping, we're talking about institutions, systems, forces that are based on exclusion or legitimacy. One of the examples I think that is helpful is that of Webster's Dictionary. Every year, new entries of terms are entered into Webster's Dictionary. And what that serves to do is legitimize those terms, right? And so we might have terms floating around in different cultural spaces, in different speech communities, whether that term is something like sus, which I brought up to my students this week because that is one of the new words that have been entered into our language, or if it's something like twerk, which I don't know everyone's life history, I don't know how familiar you are with the concept and practice of twerking. Twerking is a dance style that was popularized and created by women of color in larger urban cities that was very famously co-opted by Miley Cyrus in 2013 and became very much a part of her brand. 
and then she mainstreamed this concept of twerking. And no, I won't do it if you ask me to. <laughs> Unless you're willing to tip. And then, you know, well, I mean, I don't know. I haven't done a twerk since undergrad, so I don't know if we're going to be doing that this evening. But how is it that we make this sort of pathway of this process, this practice of a particular kind of dance that becomes named and identified in language as twerking, it is a popular practice among black women, it gets co-opted or maybe even appropriated by Miley Cyrus, and then it's mainstream, she profits dramatically from it, it becomes part of her public brand and imaging at the time, and then a couple of years later, lo and behold, it was entered into Webster's Dictionary. So gatekeeping of language and the ways in which we are allowed to name our experience in and through language. And then the last part is women's truth into men's talk. What kind of language landscape have we created that allows women to enter in their experiences? For example, one of the things that we oftentimes do and that has been popularized within, I think specifically about a workforce context, is the use of athletic and sports metaphors. Whether it is framing your, your co-workers as teammates, something very specific, or something general that's easy to grasp, all the way to more specific niche examples that rely on overly jargonistic terminology unique to sports. Whether it's about a particular kind of play, or a score, or whatever kind of language lingo you're using for sporting. You come into, let's say, the office break room, and there's a group of men sitting around, and they're having this conversation using sports metaphors. And a woman steps in. Well, thinking back to how we socialize women to not be associated with sports, and if we do encourage women to be an athlete when they're little, or allow them to be, it's oftentimes framed not as a possible pathway to a career, but as more of this like fun little hobby, right? So if we look at that, and we look at the statistics, for example, on women's pay in sports compared to men's, women are not oftentimes given a lot of incentive to take an interest in sports. So as a woman who has been kind of excluded from the athletic arena for most of her life, it's very powerful then when you go into a business room and you hear this language being used that references things and practices that you have long been excluded from. And so this is what we mean, not being able to articulate women's truth or experience in language. Because maybe you don't get those metaphors. Maybe men are not going to get your metaphors. So that goes back to, again, the sort of two culture approach to raising children. There's some other points here about that intersection between gender. We have the generic he that we find in religious language. We also see that in everyday language. One of my biggest pet peeves is the generic guys as a mode of address. Hey guys, when there's a mixed gender group of people. I've given my students plenty of times permission to call me out if I ever do this. I haven't done it. I think I slipped one time and I apologize and people are like, what is wrong with him? It agitates me because how infuriating must it be to constantly be dismissed or silenced or erased in such a way. And even women don't pick up on it because you're so conditioned to not think of it. And that is precisely part of the problem, that this he stands in to be a universal representation of all people. And we're so conditioned to see he not as gender, in the same way that we don't think of white people as having a race. I have a newsflash for you. White people have a race just as much as people of color do. The masculine he is just as much gendered as saying she. And to prove the point, sometimes I'll go into a class and I'll greet everybody, I'll make sure there's lots of men in the group, and I will greet the class by saying, hey ladies, the looks you get. <laughs> the looks you get. And in that moment when you do that, you see just how powerful a word is. So if the generic he guys um, we also know that it's somewhat common for, men, for women to have names that have men associations, but the inverse is rarely true. Um, we also know that studies, uh, or studies show us that male names are much more likely to get job applicate or to get job offers or interviews based on the same data set of applications. And this is also a race phenomenon. Statistics tell us this time and time again. We have the same stack of applications for a particular position, similar background, education, experience. Time and time again, employers will call back or email 
the people with the most male-centric, Eurocentric, white names versus everyone else. We also know that there's more words for males in the dictionary than for women. And then there's also the fact that we have the negative connotation of particular issues or con concepts related to women that have a positive association for men. So for example, a spinster versus a bachelor. Same concept, someone who is not married, right? Who then, if you are a man, it is framed as this sort of, you've escaped, you got lucky. You get to have this bachelor lifestyle. We associate all of these various things with that particular lifestyle. Whereas with women, it's framed as a bad thing. Not getting married is not seen as a positive, as something we're celebrating, but is in fact very negative and merits pity, right? And so this is just one other example. I think one of the most famous and relatable instances of this is the professional mode of address that we extend to women and men. So for men, traditionally, it is Mr., right? That is objectively what you are to be called, unless you have another professional title, like doctor. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, just kidding. Um, but men, you get the mister. Now what do women get? Now let's think about this for a moment. Historically, it has been that prior to getting married, you're miss, M-I-S-S, -S, and after you get married, you're miss, M-R-S. Now that's really interesting, linguistically, because what is it telling us? One, it's telling us that a woman is to be flexible and amenable to changes, but more specifically changes that rely on her marital status and her connection to a man. It's also telling that that first word is miss, M-I-S-S, -S, as in missing something, as in a lacking, as in an adequacy, as looking to be fulfilled. And then what happens when you become married? You become miss, which is just <laughs> mister, with an S added. So quite literally, your professional identity and mode of address becomes subsumed linguistically within the mister. And that is troubling. That is troubling. And right there, in language, we can see that androcentric ideology. Now, in the feminist uh, movement of the 1960s and 70s, one of the big advents was creating MS, MS, because it was a mode of address that was for women that had nothing to do with whether or not she was hooking up with somebody or married with somebody and did not assume her heterosexual status, right? So that is one other example. Let's get into a little bit of Sashirian linguistics. This is where I want to segue into um, the last part of our discussion before we go into an interview. So I don't want to get too philosophical, um, but Saussure is a very famous 20th century philosophical uh, linguist looking at the ways in which language produces reality. And he really is known for targeting and critiquing what is called structural linguistics. So the ways in which Western language relies upon binary in its creation and how that language construction informs binarial thinking. Saussure was interested in the arbitrary nature of language. Arbitrary in the sense that not to sound like a complete nihilist, but it really has no meaning. It, at its core, has no meaning. And so his famous model breaks down any image or concept into a three-part process. The sign, the signifier, and the signified. The chart here is a good example. The sign is the object or thing under study or reference. The signifier is the physical existence of that thing. So for example, this apple we might describe as red, leaf, round, or an apple. So we have this particular kind of language that we've created to give meaning to this. When we hear that word, we conjure up an image in our head of the thing that is being referenced. This is called the signified, the mental concept. So for example here, fruit, apple, freshness. When I say one of these things, when I say apple, something's going to come in your head. But it's only because it is this repeated incessant association that we make, meaning that it is quite arbitrary. So to put this in a gendered context, gender, as we understand it, is a bit of a relationship between signifiers, again, the thing that signal gender, and the thing that it si the signifies. So the taken to be physical makeup of a biological body. 
And because we think in Western binaries, we think of the sex body, the biological body, as either being man or woman, because once again, we are reducing it to genitalia, and to completely overlooking things like intersex people, intersex phenomena. So gender operates within those Western constructs of binarism, again, meaning that gender signifies always point to either a male or a female. And so then since gender is something that's constructed through these arbitrary signifiers, whether we're talking about pink. Pink is this color that symbolically means girls. Completely arbitrary, created in the 20th century. In fact, it used to be the inversion of this. When we think of pink, if we think of pink onesie and I say, oh, this little baby, I don't have to tell you it's gender. When I say, oh, a little baby and it was wearing pink, you automatically get this vision in your head that it's a little girl. Critical thinking would say, why do we make that association? And what does that tell us about the flexibility and fluidity and arbitrary nature of how we perform gender itself. This leads us into a final point. If we think about gender as a linguistic construction, so when I say dress, if we understand a dress, for example, as a signifier that in our head is associated with women, how then does something, how do we go about disrupting that? There's been an influx in recent years, two or three years, of men, public personas, famous men, wearing dresses in fashion, in art, in celebrity Hollywood. A couple of years ago, Harry Styles was on the cover of Vogue wearing a dress. And the uproar that this created was very confusing to me. People claiming it's the end of men, the end of masculinity. Masculinity is under assault. <laughs> and it's interesting because the very same people who make these accusations, I feel like have a, a very strong lack of, well, memory and thinking about clothing as being fluid as well. What is it I'm interested in? What is it about a dress specifically that conjures such animosity that we might see a man wearing a dress and how disruptive that is? because it wasn't all that long ago that the very same theological doctrine that people often use against trans people or gender nonconforming people, can't put a man in a dress, well, Christ did not wear a friggin' suit, <laughs> right? Christ did not wear a pantsuit, right? He wore robes, so what is it about this idea of a swath of cloth that is open here that is so frustrating, right? And so that lends us to, or leads us to this final part of thinking about gender not only as a linguistic construction, a symbolic construction, but also something that is performative. And one of the, probably the, the most famous author on this is Judith Butler, who is a contemporary 20, 21st century American philosopher, does a lot of work in gender and gender theory. And in her work, Gender Trouble, she talks about gender as performance. And she says, quote, gender is a stylized repetition of acts, which are internally discontinuous, so that the appearance of substance is precisely that, a constructed identity, a performative accomplishment, which the mundane social audience, including the actors themselves, come to believe and perform in the mode of belief. She says that um, the act that one does, the act that one performs is, in a sense, an act that's been going on one before, uh, one before, on before one ever arrived on the scene. And kind of tracing the genesis of these very concrete, rigid gender categories and the rules that we have for them, where do they come from? And she says, it's quite literally just a performance. And that in our mimicking and reciting those performances, we are in effect keeping the system alive. So all that we really have to do is start to unsight that work. Because if it's all about artifice anyway, and then I just follow suit simply because I'm told to, then we reinstitute this association between men and shorts or sneakers, for example. Now that leads me into our final part of the talk, which is thinking about transness and language and gender identity. So there's been moves to think about gender less as associated with the biological body. Why is it so deeply tethered to the biological body? What is at stake when we think about gender as a social class or as an individual identity? 
And going back to the sort of uproar that we've seen about pronouns, they, them. Somebody on Twitter last week, my partner was showing me, um, some politician, she said she was no longer using pronouns. She was banning pronouns. She had three in the tweet. <laughs> she, had, she didn't know what a pronoun was. <laughs> so there's that, right? So now that we are entering a period um, where we're having much more enhanced dialogues publicly about transness, Newsweek called, or Times, I believe it was, in 2015, 2015 called that the year of the transgender tipping point. That was the year that Caitlyn Jenner publicly came out as a trans woman. Um, Laverne Cox was on the cover of a lot of magazines that year. And so we are now in this sort of moment where we're troubling these identities. And if we can start to sort of trouble back on what we think of as gendered men and gendered women, it also opens up a possibility for troubling a lot of these binary ways of thinking, which I think is what scares people. Some definitions here um, I wanted to provide, just because I know one of the things that people critique the LGBT community about is the sort of ongoing creation of terms. But there's a power in that, because for so long my community has not been able, has not been afforded the power to give existence to our lives through language, right, in our terminology. So gender, the state of being male or female typically regarding to social constructs rather than physical attributes. Transgender, someone who does not identify with the gender that they were assigned at birth. Cisgender, refers to someone who does identify with the gender they were assigned at birth. Non-binary, someone who does not identify as exclusively male or female. Gender fluid, someone whose gender identity changes over time from one end of the spectrum to the other, so it's the fluid sort of flexible thing. And gender queer, someone whose gender identity falls on the spectrum between male and female, not kind of oscillating, um, as in gender fluid, kind of going back and forth, but you're sort of on that spectrum, you have found your place on that spectrum, but it doesn't wholly conform to one sensibility or the other. I, um, I have always identified as cis, but in theory and in practice, I do things sometimes that definitely are coded as gender transgressive, even something like carrying a messenger bag. And not only the messenger bag, but what kind of messenger bag? If you carry a brown leather bag around as a male, you're probably not gonna get too many looks, but the moment you put a particular kind of pin on it, or if you're gonna put a monogram on it, or you're gonna change the color from something that we don't associate with men, so some sort of neutral or dark color, that's when you're gonna raise red flags. And so in that sense, I've been interested in sort of a transgressing of gender expectations for a long time. And many of you probably have been, right? When you were kids, by a show of hands, any um, woman identified people in here ever like to play with boy stuff when you were a kid or have boy's interests? Okay. Fellas, any of y'all ever have interest in girl stuff? Okay, I did too. I loved dolls when I was a kid. I had, my grandpa built me two doll houses. Um, I loved dolls, I liked playing house. Using this language, I would probably much more be somewhere in a gender queer non-binary, but I didn't understand that. All I knew when I was little was that I was a wuss. <laughs> Truly. I, that my self-concept was totally informed by other people. I was a pansy. I was a wuss. I was a, that's what I was called, right? But now we have these terms that give validity to those experiences. And it's not really about totally doing something different, but it's about naming it differently so that we can identify it and then kind of create a community. <coughs> so with that being said, in that spirit of community, um, I want to welcome to our stage up here, uh, Ari Starks, who is a student of mine currently, and also at Lincoln, obviously. And Ari has very courteously agreed to sit down for just a chat, a little conversation um, to kind of demystify some of these things, to humanize and put a name with a face. So um, welcome, Ari. Hey. I like the suit, by the way. Thank I could you. never pull off that pattern. Yeah, it would look like a freeway. <laughs> I think that would be very not good. So thank you for joining us. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, I've got a few questions here I'd like to chat with you about. Um, and again, I think that this is kind of a safe space for people to talk.
talk and hopefully you know we can stimulate discussion and ask questions as long as things are appropriate and we can talk more about that in a moment. So first off, I just want to ask you, um, what do you identify as and what does that term mean to you? So for me, I would say like a trans man, trans guy, and that just kind of means somebody who is assigned female at birth who now identifies as a male. So like transgender basically just stands for us. Well, how did you know that you were trans? Was there a particular point, an epiphany? Oh yeah. gosh, that. <laughs> It's been like a, a long time coming. I had lots of people in my life, like my mom, like she said, she took me to the doctor once and the doctor was like, oh yeah, you're gonna look just like me, your mom when you grow up. You're gonna like grow up and get the stuff like her. And she said, I started crying. And how old were you? I, was, I think I was like nine or 10. <laughs> like, okay. yeah, and I just never- Was she ugly? I think that's what she thought in the moment. She was really offended. She was like, dang, you don't wanna look like me. But like. I always would like my dad, and people would say that I would get really happy about it, or just I never fit in with, I guess, more stereotypical like female things. Again, I was like the, the tomboy, rough and tumble boy. Like I used to get in trouble all the time for going into like men's restrooms because I was like, I just truly thought I was like a guy, and didn't. Mm -hmm. Like as I got older, I understood. I'm like, okay, so there is a difference. My brain wasn't clicking. How did puberty? impact that because I know for me um, as a young queer kid I up until puberty I was always interested in things more associated with girls mm -hmm. I like to play dress up with my friends I liked dolls I typically w was attracted to media that might have been marketed more towards girls like Disney movies that I like were always princess movies mm -hmm. um, when I hit puberty I, I never had any sort of sense of not being a boy, I just happen to be a boy who liked girl things. When I hit puberty, that's when um, my own experiences kind of went from, oh, I, I very innocently like girl things or things associated with girls, but it didn't have a sexual component to it or, or dimension to it. When puberty hit, it was like, oh, I'm starting to have these feelings about boys mm -hmm. that I had not before. And so I'm wondering if that was a, a point in your life where maybe things changed or intensified. Or um, very, very simply put, puberty was like hell. I, I hated puberty. It was awful. One of like the worst things ever. Like, did not like it. Mm -hmm. So I guess for me, what kind of changed was like all my other friends were like, "Yeah, we're starting to get like boobs and stuff. All these things are happening." My mom's like, "Oh, you got your period. You're becoming a woman." And I'm over here like, "Man, th this this is not it. Like, this is just." <laughs> And at first I thought it was somewhat normal because I don't know if any woman really likes getting their period. I don't think any woman's going to be like, oh, yeah, my period's going to go great. Like, that's, that's just not a thing. That's maybe not a thing. Maybe one, uh, well, from experience with my friends, <laughs> those who are like, mm -hmm, maybe had a pregnancy scare, they're like, thank God it's Yeah, like, no, nobody's overjoyed, but I just kind of felt very, like, disgusted, just very, like, I didn't like how, how, I, how I looked. Like, everything about me just felt really disgusting. I wore, like, baggy clothes all the time. I don't think I started wearing shorts again until I want to say college. Like I didn't wear shorts. Like it would be like 90 degrees. Did you feel like a stranger in your own body? Yeah, it was It was just, it was very uncomfortable because you just don't ever like how you look. Like I, I had have, have like baggy clothes galore. Hey, yeah. Just nothing ever felt right. Please walk through. We'll be closing in. Continue. Okay. Yeah, just nothing ever felt like right, I guess. It just was a lot of like feeling disgusting and very, because you didn't have a name for it. Yeah. Hmm. It's almost as though That's language so cool. has an important <laughs> role in all of this, isn't it? Um, at what point did were you able to put a name to this sort of unspoken thing, and what was that conversation like with your parents? Um, so I was in like eighth grade when I figured it out. Um, so I could like identify trans. And what year was this? Well, that's maybe year. I was like 13, 14. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, it's like 13, 14, I've been identifying as trans, and now I'm like 20. And how did you find out about this idea of trans? The reason I ask what year is, when I was nine or 10, that was, I, I didn't know what trans was. That was not something that, if, if, tr if this idea of gender transgression was represented in a film, um, it was always the punchline, right? Like a male being in a dress. It wasn't introspectively, it wasn't done in this way to show that people live like this, it was to make a mockery of them. Right. And so were you, um, was this like 2015, 16? I, I feel like it was. I feel like it was around that time. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it was It was like around that time because I started using like the internet 
way well, more. Well, that was my question. Yeah, it was How did you internet. know about this trans thing? Mm -hmm. How did you go, oh, that's what I am? It was because of the internet, at least for me, because... They can do good in the world. I know, right? So <laughs> the case, the case there are moments. Great. Right. And so I kind of realized through, like, that, just through the internet, like, I don't remember specifically what I typed up, but I was like, is it weird to, like, mm -hmm. feel like a guy when you're a girl? Like, it's wild. Mm -hmm. And then all this stuff saying transgender popped up, and I was like, ooh. I was like, this is not the universal experience. Even talking to my friends that were girls, I was like, yeah, we, we don't just like hate this and that about ourselves, right? And everybody was like, Aaron, what, what are you talking about? And like, they're like, that's not normal. And I'm like, oh, that's wild. Um, it reminds me of the scene in Mean Girls where they're all, they're in her room and they're all taking their bodies apart because that's what women are conditioned to. They're scanning their mirror and she's like, I hate my lips, I hate my thighs. And you're like, I hate my womanhood. Literally. <laughs> and no one related. Like, no one related. Sure. And then I didn't tell my parents until I was a sophomore in high school. Okay. And that. Like, there is a lot of, unfortunately, like, homophobia in the black community. Mm -hmm. So my parents didn't take it very well. My mom, I, I told you this. Like, when I first told them, my mom was like, I thought you were going to say you were a lesbian. Like, I was, I was not expecting all this. Like, but she was, she was just kind of more neutral. But my dad, he was like very religious. He was not happy. They were not rocking with it. Mm -hmm. And so even now, like present day, we're still working on that. My mom's a little more neutral, but my dad's still pretty like hard on it. But then, you know. Okay. Well, what do you wish you could tell people about being trans? Uh, you know, an audience of people who maybe don't have a trans friend, a trans student, a trans family member whose closest proximity to trans subjectivity is in and through media contact? Um, I would say it's not how it's portrayed in media in terms of maybe just like the easiness of being trans. Like like you said, people just see like, like Laverne Cox or Caitlyn Jenner and they're like, oh, you just go through, get surgeries, you do all this, but like it's a process. Like for me to get on hormones, I had to like get a, like a letter from my therapist and I see a doctor every couple of months. And like it's, it's this whole process and you do like informed consent stuff. Like you can't just go in and say like, I want this or like, mm -hmm. I am this. It's a whole process that again, it isn't necessarily like a fun or, tr or trendy thing. Like now present day, I'm like, okay, being trans is just kind of a thing that I am, it's like what I do. But it wasn't like a fun thing. Like I don't think anybody wants to be like uncomfortable and like hating themselves and having- And also put you know, your, yourself at risk for scrutiny right. and even physical um, violence, right? right? Um, I mean, that's the thing I said at the beginning of the talk, is what a privilege it must be to live in a world where your body um, isn't seen as a site of political warfare, right? right? Um, that's quite a radical idea to me, um, because I'm not trans, but even as a queer person who's gay, um, I certainly know what it feels like to have your sexuality be a political minefield, right? right? Simply just because it's not reflective of those who have authored the boundaries of our society, right? right. And if we're not adhering to or staying within those boundaries. Um, what for you is the significance of language and terminology as it relates to your transness or your gender identity? Um, so one of the things that I was asked about early on for this talk was the topic of uh, pronouns. So, um, how has the language, you know, we talk about gender queer, gender fluid, even the emergence of transness on a mainstream level, um, what significance does that have? I think it's important because I think it's good to have people know about different identities just so you can be like referred to in the correct way and to kind of put a name to things that people have been feeling and then I think that like pronouns are important. Again, it's so funny now seeing all these people be like, I'm never gonna use pronouns do this or that, and I'm like. You don't know what pronouns right, are. Right, you don't know what they are. Like, we use them all the time in daily conversation. And so for me, it's been really important. Like, I've, I've been getting better on correcting people on my pronouns mm -hmm. and kind of doing that a little better and being like, hey, it's like a comfortability thing, and most people are pretty cool with it. Um, and I think it does help, like, even teachers doing things now, having, like, their pronouns in their, like, emails or when they introduce the class, just stuff like that. You said something interesting to me the other day, Ari. You said, um, I appreciate it when professors put theirs, in, their pronouns in like their email signature because it shows that they like get it. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're being mindful of this particular thing. 
Um, and I think that's really important. And I, I, I come from more of a, a critical training um, in my PhD. And so that was just very much the norm um, where I'm from and my educational background. And I think I take it for granted sometimes living in a, or working in a university atmosphere, for example, where we should be striving to be at the forefront of thought, right? And, and helping be the authors of that change. Um, but I think that's something that probably a lot of organizations need to work on is implementing that to help normalize it. Um, did you ever use language as a kind of stepping stone or buffer as you went on your gender identity journey? Um, and I ask that because I think back to when I was 16, which was a little earlier than when you were 16. <laughs> this was about 2005. Um, you have to snarl. <laughs> that was rude. They just like, snarled and went, Ugh. I was like, my bad, my bad. I was like, I was like four. That's <laughs> no job will make you feel older. I'm just saying, my bad. You just are constantly in touch with young people, <laughs> and you just get older. <laughs> it's like uh, Matthew McConaughey's character says in um, Days and Confused. He's this creeper guy who stalks high school girls and said, you get older and older, they stay the same age. <laughs> That's how it feels being a professor. <laughs> and then when you do things like snarl, I'm reminded of my own mortality. So thank you. Of course you're not going to I appreciate that. Um, I know that when I came out to my parents and to my friends, I first said that I was bisexual mm -hmm. because it was a term that still linked me to some way to heteronormative worlds, right? It's like I hadn't fully made the jump yet. I had up here, but outwardly in my language, there was bisexual function as a very kind of soft buffer to getting into that world. And so I'm thinking with transness, did you identify as other things first, either gender fluid or gender queer? Did you use they, them as kind of a pathway stepping stone before moving to he, him? Yeah, it's funny you say that because I remember being in seventh grade and that's when I figured out I was bisexual. And I kind of started learning about trans people. And I was like, man, being a trans person seemed like it'd be really hard. Like, I'm glad I'm not gonna go that, that route parents, I was like, I'm God safe, yeah. Of humor. And then eighth grade came and I was like, ooh, this is embarrassing. I did not, I was like, dang. And I kind of started playing around with other stuff. Like I did play around with like gender fluid and I used like he, he, she, they pronouns and then did that for a bit. And then slowly it was funny because things started dropping off. Cause it was like, it was like he, she, they, and then it was he, they, and then it was he. just he. And then it was no longer like, gender fluid, it was like trans, and I was like, well, this just got interesting, it's like my thinking, so. Well, it's interesting because we try so hard, especially if you're marginalized in some way, to latch onto any sort of currency that you can, or any sort of thing that has currency in like a cis heteronormative world, to establish or maintain some sense of humanity to that audience, right? And so in, in so doing that work of trying to maintain some sort of connection to it, you lose part of yourself, right? Um, because you're covering part of yourself through that language. Um, Peggy McIntosh, she created a, a listicle a number of years ago called The Invisible Knapsack of White Privilege. And in it, she identifies 26 things that kind of symbolize in very everyday practical ways white privilege. Um, and just a couple she on the list is, I can criticize our government and talk about how much I fear its policies and behavior without being seen as a cultural outsider. And I can easily buy posters, postcards, picture books, greeting cards, dolls, toys, and children's magazines featuring people of my race. Just two instances of some of the privileges that as a white person I have that maybe I don't think about. And so I'm wondering if there are any invisible privileges associated with cisgender folk that maybe being trans has made you more um, aware of. Um, I would say like the, the pronoun thing, like a lot of times now, because I've been <coughs> pronouns for like over a year, like most people don't think about pronouns. You, can, you probably just see when somebody looks at you and knows what you are, but especially as I've gotten further in like my transition, I'll see people like look at me and they'll be like, I can see the gears turning, like I, I see them, because mm -hmm. they're like, okay, you kind of sound like this, you kind of look like this, but you have facial hair, so I'll have people who will say like. They're doing the signifier, signif 
side thing. Yeah, right? they're like, trying to figure out like what I am. They're trying and, to box you. Yeah, and then I'll have some people say she, and then I'll have like people like I hear like lots of they's from people sometimes. They'll be like, yeah, like they. Or, Do you want to explain that at all to our audience? People who might have any confusion surrounding the they them, because historically this has been a pronoun that has been used to designate a plural group of people, right? And so we have now moved into a space where we can use they them um, as comprising just one individual. And that seems to really um, throw a wrench in people's cognitive thinking right. there, just unable to grasp this. Like, you're one, but you're they? What? Are you multiple <laughs> people? Or are there like ghosts in you? Yeah, I think people get confused with, with they, them. But like most things, it's like, don't make it more complicated than it is. Like, if somebody, good example, like, somebody like cuts you off in traffic, you don't know their gender, you're gonna be like, oh my God, they cut me off, or like, they suck, or even like, we do it for dogs. Do like, we though? Because I wanna go back to this, this generic he. Mm -hmm. Because I found that most of the time people go to he. And it's the same even if we don't even think about pronouns, think about a police force. Think we usually say policeman, right? Like if mm -hmm. we see a cop car, it's all a policeman. And, and we don't track this, we don't think about it, but that really tells us a great deal, right? About the, the association between maleness and an authority figure there and just making that assumption. And, and I think that they then is a really excellent place to move into our language because it includes everybody. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of the the pronoun version of y'all means all, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm from the South, so I use y'all means all <laughs> all the time. But as a pronoun, they them, it really, it can encompass a group of people, but it can also just mean, yeah, they went to the store, right? right? It, it's that simple. And, and I guess I've just struggled with the misunderstanding um, I will be generous in my thinking about people's misunderstandings. What I can't be generous about at this point is the outward hostile resistance to using that term. Um, because that resistance is not a resistance to a term itself or a grammatical system. It's a resistance to seeing someone as a human in the way that they wish to be treated and seen. And that is such a, a damning thing to do and way to be. The last question I have for you. So you are black, and we talk a bit in our classes about intersectionality, about this idea of multiple categories of existence kind of coming together to shape your positionality in this world of being black, being trans. What has been your experience like specifically um, within the black community or as a black person, and also attending Lincoln, which is historically a black college or university. It has that designation still. So I'm curious if, if that has, you know, lent any unique insights or experiences. It has been a, a journey of like lots of ups and downs with that. So like I said, there is a lot of like homophobia within like the, the black community. Like a lot of my extended family still don't know that I'm trans or, you know, certain things because it's just like, I don't want to mess with that. Like my grandma was born and raised in Little Rock, Arkansas. Like I'm, I'm not messing with that. <laughs> at all. No. And so it, it's a lot of like back and forth. Like I've had some people that are really cool with it. And what I've noticed usually is like black women are way more cool to me and, and like chill with me about something I'm trans, but like black men, they just, I don't, I don't know, they just. There's a lot of interesting politics and logistics tied up in black masculinity specifically. Yeah, like they're, they're way more like hostile with it. Like when I first came here, like a lot of my like initial friend group I had, a lot of them were like black women and they were really cool. Like. One of my friends, Sydney, she's out there right now. She's my best friend. Love you, Sydney. Um, she was like one of the first people I met here because I was very apprehensive because I'm like, I'm coming from Kansas City, which again, still Missouri, but you know, bigger, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. more like like liberal to like Jefferson City, smaller, very conservative. Mm -hmm. and I didn't know what to expect. I'm like, I don't know what to do. And she was really cool and nice and like kind of helped me navigate all that. But it definitely even <coughs> day to day can get really iffy because some days people are really nice and cool to you and then other days you have people being like disrespectful and being mm -hmm. like oh don't you feel embarrassed or like my dad would always call LGBT <laughs> stuff or me being trans like white people shit and I was like oh, I'm like that's very interesting I'm like, that's I'm a, that is a that. mindset that actually like dates back quite a long time um, <coughs> the thinking that gay men was a white person right. invention um, uh, Um, well, are there any other things that you would like to have our audience know, having this platform?
platform where you can have this diverse group of people who are here to listen and maybe talk a little. Um, are there any other closing kind of final things that you would like to? I think my biggest thing is just like respect. Like I, I'm at a point in my life now where I, I understand that everybody is going to like agree with what I say or how I live my life and that's fine, but you can like respect me. Like I, I had friends throughout high school who I knew like Don Logan you know, like trans people or the LGBT community, but they never called me like out of my name. They were always respectful. They used my pronouns. So my biggest thing is just be respectful. Like you can go home and literally say like burn the gays all you want, which is kind of intense, but like that's what you're into. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna say like kind of, but I'm like you have the like the liberty to do that. But I think it's okay to be like respectful to somebody and just you know they show you human decency, <coughs> you show them human. I think that's a really good note to end on with our talk. Human decency. It's a good thing. Hey, it's a good thing. Respect is cool. Respect is cool. Well, thank you so much, Gary. I really appreciate it. Um, I appreciate it. Um, thank you. Um, well, you want to sit up here if you want. Actually, I might have a question. So uh, I think I'm done talking. Uh, Ari is done talking to me. So we will now take some questions if folks have some. Yeah. <laughs> well, it really got me thinking, um, Mix, uh, talk about, you know, the, the acceptance of the tomboy versus the wuss, you know, and, and it made me start to think about you as a trans man, um, I wonder what your perception is of privilege being a trans man over being a trans woman, and I want you to think about, because I know that you've done some public speaking at Lincoln and some education of yes. us professors <laughs> on, on what is this whole trans thing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and have been willing to put yourself out there. And I wonder um, what your perception is for trans women, whether that would have been as easy to do if you were a trans woman. And then also, how do we how do we change that? Because if trans women are not able to speak their truth in public, are are we having that lack lack of language about trans women? It, it literally kind of goes back to like what you were talking about. Like even even with trans women, <coughs> who, you know, maybe previously identified as men, now that they're being seen as women, they're now drawing the shorter end of the stick. So mm -hmm. like with trans women, it's way harder for them to compete in sports. Um, usually, when it comes to them transitioning, the effects aren't as intense like once you take testosterone it's very intense it's a very aggressive hormone but like estrogen it still helps but it doesn't do as much um, a lot of trans women aren't really either given like I feel like a proper platform there's no more sexualization because now they're like oh you've got like new boobs or you have this and so I find that people are way more interested in like the anatomy of trans women than they are trans mm -hmm. men well, I think part of that is it's an extension of the attitudes that we have about cis bodies, mm -hmm. right? This like androcentric nature. Um, I, I, from my observations and looking at public discourse surrounding this, there seems to be a lot more acceptance of trans men versus trans women. And that's not so different from a lot more acceptance of tomboys right. versus yeah. mm -hmm. sissies, right? Mm -hmm. And so once again, it's this idea that well, you're coming over to the right side at the very least, because oftentimes with queer men, if you're feminine, if you're if you are interested in women's things, or if you're gay, it's rendered a bit of a betrayal to your species. How could you <laughs> abandon this, you know, group of men? And I'm like, well, I didn't. I'm just going to a new group. Of men. <laughs> I'm just joining a different kind, you know. And so I see a lot of that, those similar logics with trans men. And it even happens with like. Even the black community, like I talked to my dad about it. He was like, oh yeah, like, when I told him I was a trans guy, he said it would have been worse if I was a trans woman because it's like, the, again, my dad's like, my dad's one of those people where when Harry Styles wearing the dress, he's like, oh, masculinity is gone. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh no, dad, that's so crazy. That's wild. But <laughs> that's and wild. Yeah, 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 but like, even even that, like even the, even in the, the, the black community, <coughs> if you're like a, a black trans man, it's again, a little easier, but then when you're like a, a trans woman, they're kind of like, oh, you're like leaving behind masculinity and what about all that testosterone? And it's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's another prevalent issue. It's like, no matter what, to be a woman, you like can't win. Like it, like it sucks. That's like, the moral of the story. <laughs> it just sucks. Mm -hmm. 
Other questions? Well, I have kind of a spin-off on that, which is, <laughs> it, yes. it got me thinking that, um, you know, that said, your early rearing was in this culture of womanhood, right? And so the, the power that, that comes with that, or lack thereof, is, it, it occurs in everyday conversation through language. So we know that women end sentences with a lilt and tend to smile more and tend to do all of these sort of deferential sort of things. They have trouble saying no and things like that, right? Where men can be more to the point and direct and things like that. So that, I wonder how that plays out in being trans, you know? Are you, are you still wedded to some of those early sort of female rearing where you, oh, I, I know you well, right. I know you <laughs> smile a lot in <laughs> conversation, you know what I mean? Maybe, um, maybe that is less associated with maleness, that habit. Yeah, that's, it's, it's hard because I'm a very like energetic person, so lots of people that do me with me be like, oh, I'm like a trans, like I'm a trans guy. Um, I know I get read as more like flamboyant or like a feminine and stuff, and it, it's more complicated when I'm like, you know, I, I prefer like, Women over men. Like if I did somebody, it'd be like a straight relationship. That's a whole nother. But that. Do you have that a boyfriend does, though. No. I do. Yeah. Okay. Crazy how life works out, isn't it? <laughs> but he's also he's up. but he's also a feminine trans guy. So I. But it it definitely does make it harder because I do have a lot of I guess people would say like effeminate traits. So sometimes I'll find myself just like trying to conform to those things. Where like I don't cross my legs anymore. I don't do certain things. I'm like I'm always trying to do the list of stuff. Man you're from you're <laughs> Saudi. I mean, you're doing the Butler performance, right? You're citing what you've seen of men prior to you, and in so doing, you are just reiterating and reinstituting those norms, mm -hmm. right? Have you have you felt the need to mansplain yet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you felt the need Maybe to mansplain? Yeah. It's, it's more trans mansplaining. <laughs> okay, now that's an interesting. Trans mansplaining. Well, let's not do that because we don't want it to. You know, I like to think of transness, um, trans maleness specifically, as an opportunity to kind of like make the best version of a man, right? Like, like it's like not the like pompous, uh, egregiously aggressive. You know, I don't want to stereotype and universalize men, but a lot of the impulses or behaviors that we might associate with or consider to be like toxic masculinity, for example, but right? It's funny you say that because when you do go on hormones as a trans guy, one of the side effects is you get more aggressive. <laughs> like you get angrier and like my, my friend made a joke, Sydney, she made a joke that she was like literally going on hormones is fulfilling every male stereotype because you get hungry, you're mad all the time, you can't cry as much. It's just and, and it's I think like there's some really interesting conversations about that nature nurture divide, right, that we, we've seen there because we have all of these conversations about the, the, the status of something like masculinity or toxic masculinity, how normal it is or is not, how much of it is conditioned. Um, and so to, to have your body kind of be this amalgamation of those things and see it change in this way when you inject it with testosterone and see, oh, maybe like the nurture thing or the, the nature thing, there's a part of that here that's quite literally playing out in me. Um, you know, so it's, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Um, but that's how I try to approach difference, is seeing it from, as a <coughs> point of interest rather than fear. And I think that's kind of what the, the work that has to be done is, is approaching things that we don't recognize or maybe that don't adhere to um, the codified categories or parameters that we've established to not see that as something bad, but rather than calling you into question, calling into question the things that led to me having a hostile reaction to you, for example, right? Why, why is my response to you, mine isn't, but um, if I were this like objective other, um, why is it that my response to you is one of frustration or disappointment or anger because I think in so much of the discourse we see that it is anger filled. It is anger. It is it is hatred. I don't want to sound like I'm drawing from liberal buzzwords, but there is a lot of anger there. And um, 
that anger is directed towards a person, but coming from a place of um, not a hatred of the person, but for going against the rules or something, right? So I'm all about questioning the rules that give rise to that anger rather than directing the anger itself. I don't know. That's just me, though. <coughs> Other questions? Yes? Do you think, like, the popularity of drag queens and drag kings and things like that have helped or hindered you or not individually, but just in general? I mean, like um, the popularity, you know, like RuPaul's Drag Race yeah. and all that other stuff. And I think it's, it's both. Like, I, I think there's now more awareness that different people don't conform to certain, like, gender norms or, you know, like, gender can be, like, performative. It can be art. It can be all these different things. But I also believe the adverse is true because then lots of people will, like, sexualize, like, drag queens or more effeminate people. And, like, doing drag is, like, a job. Like, that is money. That is time. That is, like, effort. And so I think it's done both where people are now more aware. But, again, it always goes back to the sexualized and the effort. Like, it's, it, it always goes in pairs and goes back to pairs. Mm -hmm. Well, Judith Butler's work on gender performativity finds its origins in drag. Um, she was, she used drag as an exemplar of the artifice of gender. And she kind of centered drag performance as this citational repetition and saying, look, we have these biological men on stage who are mimicking some version of womanhood that is identifiable to us aesthetically. And in so doing, in mimicking this heteronormative status and image, it's shoring up the kind of artificial nature of that, right? And so drag is, is, it is the origins of thinking about gender as performative in that sense. But, um, as you said, drag is a job. Being trans is your soul, it's your life, right? You're not up there on stage. I definitely don't get paid for this, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I make no money from this. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it's important not to conflate, like I definitely see the parallels obviously between the emergent mainstreaming of queer culture through like RuPaul's Drag Race and things. But I do think it's important to always be mindful that there is a distinction between doing it for entertainment, say being up there doing splits for dollars, um, versus living that, you know, as your life. Um, so, yeah. Well, I was just thinking about that question about um, Drag, drag queens and, and drag kings, and while drag kings certainly exist, they don't get popularized in the way that drag queens do, and that comes back to the issue of sexualization, because a lot of times the drag queens are really sexualized, and I just thought maybe, and maybe that's reflective of the fact that, you know, what's gay ends up being um, gay men a lot of times being the spokesperson, and lesbians being kind of in the background. So. I mean, I think I think that's interesting as well that we see, you know, all of a sudden, in the in the public sphere, that the feminized male becomes way more popular than mm -hmm. the masculine. Well, it's much easier, I think, female. to make spectacle out of the idea of womanhood, mm -hmm. um, because if you think about how we teach men to be in real life, it is emotionally anyway to be quite stoic right, and sort of docile. And that doesn't necessarily make for good entertainment. Uh -huh. And if, if drag is about this sort of camp excess of gender performance and taking all of the bits and pieces of womanhood and amplifying it times 10, the sequins, the heels need to be taller, the boobs need to be bigger, the lipstick needs to be. It's like, we teach men to be quite boring. <laughs> um, aesthetically, we do. I mean, we, we teach men to be restrained, to not give that much attention to appearance, because again, doing so like, is... Being, being like a trans guy, like, I was talking about with my friend, and I'm like, dude, like, what, what do you guys wear? Our clothes are very... <laughs> like, what is, like, what is the thing that men wear? I mean, <laughs> yeah, men's, men's aesthetics are, I think, less exciting because we've deemed them to be, and then when we've started to carve space to, like, allow more exciting interpretations, like wearing a dress, or like I was out and about downtown Columbia the other day, and it was a football game, and there's multiple dudes who I, they, they looked straight. I don't, I'm not saying that professionally, but <laughs> not, my profe but they were, they were, they, they were socializing with other people who 
look straight. The, the gaydar wasn't straight. going The gaydar was not going off. Okay, that's right. that's um, but they, there was a few of them wearing crop tops, like crop t-shirts. And this is a really interesting sort of sartorial direction that we've taken. Uh, you know, because the crop top t-shirt for men was actually quite popular in the 70s and 80s with like the little short jorts, you know, that would be cut off. Mm -hmm. And then we strayed away from that for so long and jorts were considered hyper thin and no straight man would be seen in a crop top that would have been an injustice to his gender. <laughs> but now we're at a point where like straight men are wearing crop tops and they're confident in that. And so maybe we are making the male body a greater spectacle in the way that we've always made women's bodies a spectacle for observers, read men to consume through their male gaze. Um, and that might make for better drag one day. Maybe a drag queen one day will not be showing up in, you know, a pair of tackies and a wife beater, but also a pretty gown. And who, I would much rather see that. I don't want to get wife beaters done. Yeah, I mean, it's hard I'm not to trying make. to judge, but like, it's... I am. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all so much for coming. I appreciate you spending your time with us this evening. Um, that's all I've got for you. All right, thank you. Go team, go team. Go team.